Great. So, um, if anyone has any questions for either of our speakers, um, yes? Sorry, can you say that? Sorry, how was how was the reminder of medication uh, reminder put in to the to the app? I mean, was, was it self input? Oh no, okay. For the for the medication, no, they they were they were uh, um, they were input at the by the pharmacist. So at the point of the prescription entering into the whole chain, the medication was loaded into containers that went into. If you remember, I showed a picture of a, a mobile unit, and at that point there was a small tag on the container which stored the prescription details and that was then pushed pushed into the into the system and then delivered to the to the person's home so it wasn't um, uh, from the medicaid point of view it wasn't self-entered in the the latter um, apps that i, that I showed um, probably the taught app there is the ability for the caregiver to enter the prescription details or any you can specify what reminder you want whether it's watch television uh, you know, go shopping, whatever you can, you can enter that yourself directly into the system. Uh, and just on that, you mentioned there, there you mentioned about stakeholders. Um, with regard to uh, the engagement of carers, I think it's one of probably the most important aspects of, of these applications. Um, have you thought about, or was that part of the process where, if a missed reminder, uh, was there a, a, a secondary reminder sent to the carer to check up on that? Um, the, 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 there are a number of options where we can escalate the reminder. So a bit like your, your, if you set an alarm on your phone. So you can have an alarm. If you don't acknowledge it in 60 seconds, it'll go away. It can come back in five minutes. It can come back in, in, in 10 minutes. Um, what we found where we had a scenario of carers and people with dementia, sometimes the, the carer would have acknowledged the, uh, the, the reminder. Um, but no, we, we, we didn't because, uh, and you, your question, yes, it's an interesting question. Should we have then escalated the reminder to the, the caregiver that the person with dementia didn't take the, the reminder? No, we didn't, but that's, a, that's an, interesting, an interesting point. Usually they were together. Um, so we, we, um, they did have the ability to monitor remotely um, what was the adherence to the reminders, but we didn't. We didn't ask it, but that's, a, that's a, an interesting point that you raised. Great. Any more questions? We have a mic, so we might just try and get that. It's it's going around the houses. I can talk pretty loud. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for Dr. Um, Liam Lynn. How are you using the mobile-based solutions in your clinical practice? Do you recommend certain apps for them to use, and then do you follow up with their data at a follow-up appointment to see if they were complying with your um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, to be honest with you, I, I have a menu of options for people because obviously not everybody will have a mobile phone. Not everybody will be interested in engaging um, with, a, with a technology around this behavior change. Um, so, I, I mean, the, to give you the full clinical context, obviously it involves, you know, I, I suppose it's interesting because, because we're, we're talking very much about the technology, but in terms of trying to engage somebody in behavior change, that's such a, a, a broader issue around relationship development, around you know, finding where they are in terms of their knowledge and their approach and where they are in the cycle of change. But all that aside, if we get to the nub of, it, of your question, which is around the option. So I, so I would have, um, um, if they have a mobile phone, then obviously we would, we would discuss the option around that. Alternatively, I have a series of pedometers. Uh, just just handheld pedometers. Um, some people obviously now are coming in and they've got a fuel band on um, or they've got some other form of, of mapping their activity. A lot of people will have a new iPhone. They won't even know that they have the health app and the ability. So so it's, it's about finding what they're comfortable with using. Um, and I suppose a bit like, um, uh, I mean, this struck me straight away, the similarities between this and, and a diabetic patient, for example, who comes in and shows me their their blood glucose levels, you know, and we discuss their compliance around that and alter their medication. It's a little bit like that when somebody could then comes back to me and I can say, right, let's have a look at your phone and we can see their activity. So in that way, they're giving me feedback, which I suppose 
um, they tell me at least they're motivated to, um, you know, to, to have got, you know, plenty of steps in their phone by the time we come in and sit down and talk again. So, yeah, yeah, it's a process of feedback, review, um, checking up again with them in terms of um, their activity levels and then also trying to encourage them. Um, I mean, in the whole area of ex exercise, obviously, there's, there's loads of really interesting work done around the comparison between uh, the, the lone exerciser and the social exerciser, uh, if you know what I mean, and the benefits that um, these groups garner. And it's been shown that people who, um, who exercise in groups actually get more benefit in terms of things like quality of life and health outcomes than the lone exerciser group. So I think there's a big component of encouraging people to get involved um, and uh, you know, find a peer group of some sort. Um, so, so does that answer your questions? Sort of, yeah. Great, thanks a million. Uh, another question, yeah, Eamon? Um, Eamon Costco, Medical Eagle. So I guess it's a question for both of you. Um, so we're, we're a kind of a small app developer developing apps in this space, and uh, we definitely want to kind of verify or, or put some quantification on the efficacy of the solution. A lot of people are recommending, you know, kind of more studies rather than, you know, randomized control trials. So, I mean, what's your experience of going for kind of, you know, gold standard kind of demonstration of the efficacy versus kind of something a bit more kind of shorter and quicker? Um, yeah, what, what, I, I, I think in, in the end of the day, and I, I know Jeremy Watt, who is a big history with the Cochrane collaboration, would be here. I mean, in the end of the day, the quality of the evidence is important, I think. Um, so I, I think it is important to try and aim high and not just to go quick and dirty. I mean, quick and dirty is, is, is useful at times, um, um, but, but I think in terms of convincing a clinician and a healthcare provider cohort um, in, uh, in terms of adoption of interventions, I, I think it is important to, um, to, to use randomized control trials. Okay, I know there's loads more burning questions, but I know more burning than that is the need for caffeine. So we're going to take our coffee break now. Um, we're resuming again at 20 past 11. Just like to say a massive thank you to the morning speakers. We have fantastic speakers lined up after the, the coffee break as well. So we'll see you all back then. Thank you very much.